So tonight, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we have our local University of Irvine, uh, Professor Nader Bagarzadeh joining us. And he's going to give us a, a talk about machine learning computer architecture enhancements. Um, so this will be great. Uh, I think it, obviously if you've all been, if you're all here, you, you are probably uh, understand what the <laughs> topic will be and is looking, are looking forward to it and waiting for me to uh, uh, get, out of, get off the screen. So without further ado, let's uh, switch to Professor Bagarzade. Welcome, uh, Professor, and uh, floor is all yours in just a few seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. I also appreciate uh, Farhat's uh, introduction to your group for me to give this talk. He's always been my support, and uh, I really appreciate uh, he asking me to help out with his talks and as, as well as uh, others. And also Daniel for uh, setting up this, uh, this um, Zoom. So let me start with my first uh, slide. Uh, can you see it? I need to share, I guess. Is it clear? No, it's not. I don't think it's sharing yet. Uh, it's not sharing yet. Okay, let me share screen. Okay. I think now we should be okay. Yeah, we see your computer screen. How's that? That's good. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I will be talking about the uh, machine learning, as the title says, uh, architecture enhancement, that's my background. Uh, I'm not specifically working on machine learning algorithms. What I'm interested in, what can we do to help improve some of those uh, models, networks, and so on. So I'm going to go through some introductory material, but there are some fun slides that I will share with you, especially, uh, you know, when we talk about machine learning, uh, what, what kind of a system are we trying to mimic? And that's obviously the, uh, the brain-like operation. So here are some terminologies. By the way, uh, IEEE Spectrum uh, has a very good set of articles about the AI. And uh, it did mention something interesting about uh, some of the things that I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, the notion of artificial intelligence came about uh, in 1956. Uh, John McCarthy had a workshop, I believe in uh, Northeast, something close to Dartmouth University, uh, where he was teaching at that time before he moved to Stanford. And uh, he coined that uh, terminology of machine intelligence, calling it artificial intelligence. Uh, later on, uh, the notion of machine learning uh, was coined by Arthur Samuel in 1959. And then uh, within that domain, uh, we had the brain-like development of machines. What can we do to mimic the way the brain works? Of course, it's, it's not gonna be possible probably for decades, but what we're trying to do is to maybe learn from the way the brain works and do some of those functions. We have a very limited uh, hardware at, at our Useful, per useful because we are limited by the number of wires, transistors, so we could not ever do what the brain does, but we can try to model it close enough. So I will explain to you what that closeness means. And then within the category of brain-like, we have the neural networks, which is the focus of what I'm gonna talk about today. And within that is this deep learning, concept of deep learning, where many layers are used for data processing. And then there's another notion called spiking, which uh, one of the, major corporations, Intel has been working on that. And I have a couple of slides from what they have announced recently that I will talk about. But the focus of this would be basically on uh, deep learning models. Why is there so much interest in this area? And these are two areas that are of interest to me, the data centers and autonomous vehicles. But there are many, many other applications that are driving the machine learning uh, domain. As you can imagine, data centers are trying to provide uh, platforms that can do machine learning algorithms efficiently. Different major co corporations have taken different routes. Uh, I will address them a little bit later, especially Google and Microsoft. But data centers have many issues, but the machine learning is becoming a major player. I read somewhere not too long ago, 
that every processor that is being designed, at least I think it was an Intel executive was saying, must have a machine learning component uh, accelerator or some notion of handling machine learning uh, applications. So that's a really big uh, impact on the design of next generation processors. It almost brings to mind uh, the notion of floating point. Some of us that uh, have been in this business for a while know that the floating point unit used to be uh, away from the processor, it was a coprocessor. And all of a sudden we're seeing the machine learning is behaving like that in terms of uh, need to be in the processor architecture. The other driving force, not the only one, the other important driving force is autonomous vehicles. This is tens of billions of dollars, maybe more that are involved in this particular business and machine learning is playing a major role. There have been setbacks. It was predicted by uh, none other than Elon Musk that in, by 2022, we would have uh, close to level four uh, autonomous vehicles. We're nowhere close to that for next year. Uh, they are making significant progress, but uh, the projections are not uh, in place for various reasons, uh, because some of the algorithms uh, have to be tuned and there are problems with it. You saw some of the accidents that were reported. So um, this is not about marketing, but let's look at the global market of the impact of AI. Uh, the first one is $130 billion uh, in 2025 for AI applications. And uh, that's three times more than what it was in 2019, according to IHS. The AI hardware, which is more important and interesting to me, is going to be close to $70 billion in the mid 2020s. So this is, a, this is not a one-off type technology. It's going to continue and it's going to be uh, in almost every sector of our lives. Although the, the uh, IEEE Spectrum articles that I was talking about talks about some of the flaws with the uh, AI. And one of them that I want to mention here is the math. AI systems cannot do math very well. They can do a lot of classification, identifying objects and so on. But when it comes to math, they're not very good at it. And that's really interesting. There are other things that they're not good at. Intuition. So this I took from IEEE Spectrum to October, 2017. A self-driving car powered by one of the popular artificial intelligence techniques may need to crash into a tree 50,000 times, but by part of the training, so to speak. But a baby wild goat cannot afford to do that. And it has to be able to survive and it cannot go through that crashing sequence. So what is it that about the uh, biological systems, in this case, baby goat that can survive this kind of a learning and training? That intuition, that intuition that a three-year-old has we cannot copy yet. Uh, some of the uh, government agencies are looking at to AI 2.0 where intuition and some of the other aspects of that is being considered, uh, but we're at the very early stage of that and it's not as well developed as uh, machine learning algorithms. So a little bit of our brain so we can appreciate what all of us hopefully have is that uh, the brain is, um, it's really a very small supercomputer. It has uh, almost 1.3 kilograms of neural tissue and it consumes 20% of our body metabolism. But the other thing that really is interesting, it, it's burning about 20 watts, whatever they calculate with calorie consumption. And, a, and an exascale processor supercomputer is 20 megawatts, at least targeted at. Exascale is the 10 to the 18 floating point operations, which is uh, supposed to be coming online this year or early next year in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and so we can see that uh, we have a major problem with our systems in order to get to the level of processing of a, of a brain, we have a lot of power consumption issues that we have to deal with. The other issue is to do with the number of synapses or connections. We cannot handle as many connections that, that the brain does already. And the number of neurons, if you call these simple processors, we are not at that level anytime soon. There are some other things that, uh, that it's worth 
thinking about is the brain is basically a mixed signal computing. It has some analog, some digital like, and I'm putting my computer architecture hat on. There is no centralized clock as far as one could tell. Uh, I'm not counting the centralized clock that you use for sleeping and waking up. That's a different story. I'm talking about the brain processing. Uh, the simulating the brain is very time consuming and uh, energy inefficient. The most important thing is direct implementation of the uh, implementation of the brain is going to be uh, difficult to achieve. It requires a lot of computation and we're not there yet. Although there are some uh, organizations looking into that direction. This is where we start looking at how the brain works and the modeling and that's what uh, the neural network idea came about. So you have the nucleus and you have these axons like the connections. And from the point of view of computation, it's, it's almost like a computing node where it receives inputs, it multiplies, sums the inputs by their weights and adds a bias and it goes through a selection and activation function. That is our model for what the brain does. It's not even close to exactly uh, well, it, it's close enough, but it's the best we can do. And this is the computation. This is really the main idea behind these set of slides. The machine learning algorithms that we are doing, it's matrix computation, mostly matrix multiplication. That's it. So we're trying at least this model of uh, convolutional uh, neural network that I will be talking about. So we're putting back our hat on regarding matrix algebra how to do matrix computation. And if you recall from the previous slide, we had that node and you get the weights and the inputs. We go through this summation, that's a matrix multiplication because you have a vector and you're multiplying by the weights. So we have the weights times the inputs, you get a result. That's a, that's a first row of the, the matrix of the weights times the vector of the input. So we have to do this very efficiently. That's the bottom line. And the, uh, there are uh, many, many ways of doing this. And some of the slides will refer to that. And so this, uh, the title of the next slide is, we're almost sure, at least I have not heard otherwise, that the biological neurons are not multiplying and adding. There is, there's no indication of that. Now, maybe some scientists will come up with that a few years from now, but. As far as we know, they're not multiplying and adding uh, to do the computations of the neurons. We can model that by performing multiply and add operations. A direct implementation is not possible yet. It, it's not gonna be completely uh, impossible, probably sometime in the future, but we have major problems in terms of connectivity, number of processors, the heat, uh, you know, if you have a lot of uh, processors, billions of them, you will have a thermal issue. The brain doesn't have a thermal issue unless there are some other extraneous uh, problems. Uh, and so we have to be able to do that uh, properly. We have another issue. We are running into the, to the top, to the, to the constraints of VLSI scaling. And we are not able to scale that at least using the standard model of scaling. So the deep learning limitation and advantages, we are basically trying to model and train by using deep learning. Deep learning is much more efficient than other techniques because we don't have to program it. We basically train it and we let it loose and it will try to infer, to have the inference to figure out what's going on. Some of the things deep learning is very good at, at translation, you probably use it Regularly, if you call a call center and you go through some of the steps of detecting what you're saying, but deep learning is not good at finding the meaning of a translation. Okay, some of the limitations. Because it's based on training, you have the problem of garbage in, garbage out. If the input you give to the system for training is not good, it's not relevant, it's not properly labeled, then you get garbage out. Uh, it has to be properly labeled. It has to be the right one. And it has to have this training step that we have to do. There's also a mention about the catastrophic forgiveness, forget, forgetfulness. 
which was mentioned in the article of the IEEE spectrum, meaning that you train a system for a certain uh, set of objects. And then if you try a different thing, maybe uh, you train it for a truck being upside, right side up. And if a truck has flipped over, the system of autonomous vehicle might not be able to detect it because it has not been trained for that. Trained for that. So that's a problem. There is something called trans transfer learning, but there are some limitations to that. So people have major issues uh, regarding uh, changes in the set of inputs that have been used for training. By the way, training is a very important IP. A lot of companies will not share their uh, training uh, data set because it really helps uh, train the machine learning uh, algorithms. I would think if Mercedes-Benz is using their training set to uh, help design the next autonomous vehicle, they will not share that with their competitors because that is IP. Uh, so there are two steps. The learning step, which we have to pre uh, you have to produce the weights for the, for the model. The notion of back propagation was introduced. It's an amazing uh, contribution by Hinton and his uh, students and his collaborators, uh, meaning that the weights uh, after the first iteration, then you go back and update the, 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 the weights using some sort of a approximate su successive uh, computation. That's the one that takes most time. So a lot of simulations on supercomputers some of the work we do at, uh, with my group, the training part uh, or the learning step takes a lot of computing, but you only do it, use it once unless you want to cross train or do other kind of uh, additional training. The inference is what runs. It's when the system is left alone to perform, it would use the inference. And that takes fewer steps and uh, it's, uh, less computing intensive, thank God, because if that was gonna be time consuming, then we would not be able to have this technology at the edge. Both steps are dense matrix vector operations, unless you do some pruning. And uh, so it goes back to the original issue. We have to do a lot of matrix computations for this model of uh, neural networks. So we have a problem. We are going back and putting our computer architecture VLSI hat on, the laws of scaling laws that we had are reaching their limitations. Everybody's familiar with Moore's law. We mentioned it at least two or three times in our classes here at UCI and different uh, instructors. And that's basically just to repeat, doubling the number of transistors every 18 months is slowing down because there's a problem with uh, thermal issues and so on. There are possible solutions uh, you hear about the word chiplets for 3D ICs. Some people feel that uh, at least going to the next level is going to help out with this uh, scalability. But on a 2D substrate, uh, it is reaching its limitations with the next generation, uh, three nanometers, two nanometers, or Intel calls it 18 ang angstrom, uh, instead of calling it 1.8 nanometers. But that's what they talk about. The other important thing is Dennard's uh, law, which is, has to do with the power consumption. Uh, it was based on Dennard's law. If you use the circuit theory, which is probably too much details here, but the transistor has length and width. And uh, as you reduce the proportionality of the chip, uh, the power consumption will scale such that it will not change between different generations from uh, the, the older one to the newer one. That is not working anymore. So we have the issue of power consumption not staying the same, actually increasing. And uh, so we have, uh, we have to find ways of dealing with that. Let's review some of the computer architecture because the point I wanna make is that many of the topics that we'll be talking today are based on the computer, computer architecture concepts that we have seen for years. Uh, that's basically uh, my point is that in the past, we have seen the clock speed used. We had seen instruction level parallelism. These are some concepts in computer architecture, spatial and temporal branch prediction, 
memory hierarchy, cache optimization, multi-cores, reconfigurable computing. The current efforts for machine learning platforms are based on accelerators. Uh, I was working on accelerators uh, 20 years ago for software-defined radio. At that time, we were criticized that why would you want to add another processor uh, attaching it to the main processor because it's going to be hard to program, it's going to be complicated, and so on. All of a sudden, the idea of accelerators are back on, and it's being driven by the machine learning uh, algorithms. So the accelerators, which I refer to as domain-specific ASICs, we will want to have those because the amount of computation needed is so massive that the main processor cannot do that. This is the same idea we had for the floating point, as I mentioned. Hopefully, in the future, that accelerator will plug in to the processor. Then the notion of exotic memories. Uh, these efforts are coming back on because of the machine learning and the fact that we want to have uh, non-volatile memories that are faster than, than existing memories. As we will talk about uh, pretty soon, memory access becomes a dominant factor in uh, doing that matrix vector computation for CNN. It goes all back to that matrix computation. We are trying to do that efficiently and accessing the memory becomes a, a limiting factor. So some people have proposed putting the memory closer to those tiny processors. Most likely, maybe the biological systems probably have that uh, proximity. The other issue is approximate computing. Uh, we have done some work in my group with some colleagues in Spain on approximate computing. And the idea is, if you're doing multiplication and addition, if you go to the log domain, you can do addition of the two uh, numbers. So uh, when you're trying to multiply, you can add if they're in the log domain. Uh, and, and the point is this, if you approx do approximate computing, the neural networks, at least the CNNs, are uh, forgiving in terms of the amount of accuracy that you may carry. And they may do the good job of predicting the results, even if you're not using all the bits that you would have used originally. So they have some level of uh, approximation going on. Another important topic that goes back to many years ago is systolic arrays. It has been coming back on, which is interesting. 30, 40 years ago, it was in graduate school uh, textbooks and we didn't hear much about it for 20 or five years or so. And all of a sudden, uh, systolic arrays are uh, back on these are non von Neumann uh, processors because in a von Neumann architecture, you have this central bus, you have the memories and the processors, and they go through that uh, standard bus based architecture, which is in almost every chip. So the systolic arrays, it's a wave of computation and that works really well for that multiply add that I mentioned before. So we're always trying to, at least some of the things I'm talking about is to make that computation efficient. Uh, so ML is not just algorithms, it's hardware software innovations, okay? Now, I know a little bit about uh, computer graphics. And when I looked at the relationship between the training and inference, it reminded me of computer graphics, although they're not related in a way, but the fact that the GPUs of NVIDIA are being used for machine learning is really an interesting uh, kind of a coincidence, but uh, but in computer graphics, you may know that the ver vertex processing is floating point. You're trying to figure out these triangles and you go through the affine transforms and change the shape, make it smaller, rotate it, change the angle and so on. So that is done floating point because you need the dynamic range. The coloring or painting the image is done in pixel and integer. So you got floating point for vertex, pixel processing integer, guess what? Machine learning, the training is floating point, most of them, some papers are referring to a fewer bit, and inference is integer. So I found this parity between graphics and machine learning, which is kind of interesting and uh, it kind of stood out when I was looking at it. And so let's talk about the array processors. We did work on array processors a few years ago here at UCI. Um, this is called amorphosis architecture. 
And uh, it, it basically was an array processor in the SIMD mode, single instruction, multiple data. And it was able to do some of the computations needed for software defined radio on the physical layer. Maybe you're trying to do correlations and so on. And we worked on this with a bunch of uh, our colleagues and our students. And as you can see, there's an array of eight by eight processors, very simple processors. And there's their controller here called Tiny Risk, which we developed. And the data goes in and out of this array. And it was uh, planned for doing uh, 4G, 3G, and so on. It was supposed to be software-defined radio, meaning you can change the code and do different uh, uh, co communication uh, algorithms. This is the TPU from Google. I'm not saying that this is exactly the same, but you see the matrix multiply array. It's the order of 64K per cycle. So there are a lot more processors here than here. Of course, you know, a team of maybe 50 people worked on this, but you can see that it's streaming data. It's trying to do that matrix vector computation inside this array. And there is a similarity with this. There is some data movement here. You have the weights coming from the other side. We have this frame buffer that feeding the process. One of the things that one has to remember is when you have an array processor of this magnitude, you have to find a way to push the data into the array as efficiently as possible. Otherwise, uh, you will basically starve this uh, beast of parallel processing. And there are, so again, there's an array processor and some mechanism for that. As I was looking at array processors, I noticed that IBM has announced this uh, Tellium it's an array accelerator. Again, you can see the, the array processor here. It has, uh, with the 32 chips, they, they declare 200 uh, teraflops. That's a lot. And it does uh, 128 processor tiles. So there's a lot of computation going on. Again, it's an SIMD. So you can see that between TPU and the one we did, you have a combination of using SIMD or systolic arrays. And, uh, and their other one is Intel. There's the only spiking processor that is done by one of the major players. This has not to do with CNN. It's the spiking method, which is looking at the trails of spikes and then deciding uh, as to the output of the activation uh, function. So that's the only one. Now, as I was preparing this slides, I noticed that Intel announced a uh, Apparently it was announced some time ago, but it was in, the, in some of the publications I was looking at. It's called Advanced Matrix Extension. This is very important because all of a sudden what we see is Intel is providing for the next generation uh, uh, Xeon uh, processors that are used in servers, a capability to do matrix computation. It goes back to what I said. It's all about matrix computation. They're trying to address the uh, uh, neural network, uh, convolutional neural networks. Look at the size of this. It's eight kilobyte register file. When we teach our classes for computer architecture, we talk about uh, 60, 32 registers, 64, by, uh, 64 bits, bits each, like eight bytes. This is a huge register file stacked in the form of tiles that are used by the processor to be able to do the computation. So you can see each one of these tiles is 1K byte register. So that means the data for the computation has to be loaded into this. Now, if you look at this, there's a host, not different from the host we saw in the other architectures. This one generates the commands. This is uh, generating the command what to do with this. And the accelerators get plugged in. So this would be one accelerator. In the future, they can add more accelerators. So it is an SIMD extension. It has a huge register file. It's designed to do that matrix computation. It's called advanced matrix computation. And so, and as you can see, uh, you can get a, they claim, the claim is almost 8X improvement over matrix operations, all focused on the matrix operations that we have. One final slide here. It shows you that other accelerators can be plugged in that I mentioned earlier, okay? Uh, so let's talk about the CNN a little bit. I've talked about it several times just to show you that the process of doing convolutional neural network, which almost is the main application for all the architectures that I mentioned here, requires convolution, 
convolution is a step that we had in signal processing before. Uh, convolution dominates the computation for convolutional neural networks. And you could have anywhere from five to 1,000 layers. And as you can see, 90% of the computation is done in the CNN. The rest is done by some other steps like you can see here, but the dominant computation is, is a convolutional step. And that one has, guess what? Matrix vector computation. So what is the convolution? You have a filter. This is from the set of slides that Victoria says and is, uh, her cohort, cohorts uh, have done. So you have the filter, you're applying it to, to the input map and you're shifting it so that it's actually moving across this to create so one computation will give you one point and then you shift that, you get the next point and so on. So it's an element-wise multiplication. That element could be one bit, eight bit, 16 bit, what have you. So that's called a 2D convolution. You could have a 3D or high dimensional. So you can have multiple filters. And that's where it lends itself to parallel processing. The whole idea behind this is to do this computation efficiently and be able to handle it properly. It's all matrix vector computation. Here's an example of that. You can see that uh, we multiply this filter by that size of the input, and you get the C11, which is this point right here. Then we do the next one, we get the C12, C1, C21, and then finally C22. So all of that computation has to be done. That's why we're using a lot of registers to be able to do this efficiently. Otherwise you have to use uh, fast cache or some other methods. So, and the size of the dimension is given by this formula. So the training, as I mentioned before, requires multiple steps. There's this unique way of updating the weights, which is uh, the major contribution to uh, for deep neural network before the contribution of Hinton, there were only few layers. And the inference is basically uh, you apply the convolution and you find out whether the classification, you predict what the value of the, of the, the item that you were looking at or the image that you were looking at, what it is. You just have a probability of that in terms of your estimate. So let's look at the computation. These are different models of neural network. AlexNet, uh, Alex uh, was uh, a doctoral student at Hinton's group. He came up with this, uh, th this particular model, deep neural network. GoogleNet, VGG16, these are all different models and there are a lot more than this. It's just the ones that uh, this table uh, has the values for. It shows you the accuracy. As you can see, the top one error was about 42%, picking the correct answer in the first time. And it's getting better. And it's interesting to see the number of convolutional layers as it's getting better. In most cases, the number of layers is increasing. So the computation here for ResNet 152 is far more than uh, AlexNet by uh, at least uh, 30 times. The amount of MAC operations, MAC stands for multiply, accumulate. Multiply, accumulate uh, uh, is what we have to do. 666 million is the order of 11 billion operations. So again, the MAC has to be taken care of, a lot of parameters, and that shows the total work in terms of MAC, huge amount. And so, Everything that they're trying to do in terms of accelerators and so on is to do this computation efficiently. Now, if it's at the edge and you're trying to do the uh, machine learning, like it's a sensor or something like that, then you're limited by the amount of power you have. So you have a limitation in terms of how many layers you can do. Okay, let's go to talk about different options that we have for doing the deep neural network. One is the CPU. The other one is the, so the CPU, we have the same problem we had before with other applications. It's very good, it's very complex, it has very 
sophisticated logic, but it's not meant to do huge amount of matrix multiplication. And so since deep learning requires a lot of matrix multiplication, it's not gonna be just plain CPU is gonna be enough. And so there is a notion of using GPUs. And that, this, this, this slide basically shows you that the basic CPU has a large amount of control compared to a GPU. Look at the control in these GPU type uh, uh, block diagrams. It has fewer ALUs. With GPU, we have a lot more ALU. And it has a hierarchical cache, large cache, hierar hierarchical cache. So you have multiple levels of cache, L1, L2, L3. And uh, with this type of uh, setup, CPU is good for general purpose computing, but it's not good to do, it's not good for doing that level of parallelism. This is data path. This is just ALU type operations or floating point operations. So we're throwing computation nodes at the problem. And that's why the GPU domain, that's why the NVIDIA and others are going in this direction because they have the background, the capability to provide data parallel operation. They don't need as much cache. So they, they, uh, the small cache is sufficient. And uh, you don't need sophisticated branch prediction for some of you that might be computer architecture savvy, but the, the GPU doesn't need a, a multi-level cache for a branch prediction and so on. So we have a lot of data parallel operations. So we have to move in that direction. Again, you see the array processing as well. The other area is to use FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. Many of you are familiar with that. It happens that uh, Microsoft with the catapult architecture looked into using the FPGAs for implementing uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, the deep neural network accelerators. They picked FPGAs. Again, we have a trade-off here. We had the same trade-off with our project, Morphosis, is how do you compare GPUs with FPGAs? FPGAs have a lot of flexibility, but at the same time, that level of flexibility comes in with some overhead related to, to connecting these uh, CLBs and the power consumption and so on. So super flexible, but it's not as efficient in some applications as GPUs. The topic that is dear to me, because we worked on something similar to this early on, is this ASIC-based neural networks, meaning that you try to have a specialized hardware to handle the uh, deep neural network applications. Google worked on this for years and they announced it three, four years ago, the first uh, uh, tensor processing unit. That was the machine learning device. It was an accelerator. And I showed you the block diagram earlier that you saw some 60,000 uh, operations that could happen at the, at the uh, uh, in parallel. And uh, so they can do training and inference. And when you compare the performances, you can see that TPU has a far better performance than GPUs and CPUs, that's obvious. Of course, NVIDIA has come up with new platforms that is competing with uh, Google and the latest competition between these two is uh, probably not relevant right now. But the point is we have to apply accelerators that are tuned for these matrix computation. That's really the big picture. The CPUs are not sufficient. That's why for, for Intel Xeon processors to have that additional layer of those extra registers. Let me talk about systolic arrays because uh, some of us that took these graduate courses, we ran into the systolic arrays and then nothing happened for, um, for 25, 30 years. As you can see, systolic array is, you have a linear or two-dimensional array of processing elements. So the data comes in and it gets processed and goes back to the memory. That's the wave, that's the process of inputting the data. So one student asked me, so this looks like a pipeline of a processor, uh, if you're familiar with the processor pipelines, yes, there are multiple stages. One is instruction fetch, decode, and so on. It's not the same because they're doing exactly the same operation. This is not a pipeline of a microprocessor. 
These are doing, all of them are doing add multiply and then passing on the results to the next one. It could happen in a 2D array. So systolic array is all of a sudden became a popular technique because we can stream the data, stream the information and do the computation in parallel. Let's look at an example. Uh, this is a matrix, matrix operation. So if we have a systolic array like this, this is a 2D systolic array and look at the indices for the A and B. Going back to this, you got A00, B00, A01, B02, and the same thing. You were familiar with that, hopefully. So A00 comes in, this one gets multiplied and it passes on A00 to the next one. That's the pipeline, except it's not, it's not, uh, it's not doing differently because it's taking A00 multiplying by B01. But we needed A00, B01, right? A00, B01. So we're multiplying one by one and the stacking of this data is very critical, how they're connected and how the information is comes and it's accumulating. So it is A00, B00, A01, B10 is gonna do the next term. And as you can see, it's doing the computation in, in the fourth cycle, it's done. And in the fifth cycle and the sixth cycle, we're done basically. So. So this shows you that uh, you can do the computation very efficiently of a matrix of that size. So systolic array is one of the uh, methods that was used for the TPU to be able to do the functionality. Let's talk about memory because unfortunately you can do all the computations you want, but if the data is not available, there will be a delay in the computation. This is one of the important parts. You have to have a balanced memory and computation accesses. So uh, there are different methods of doing that. If you use the standard DDR4 module, you get something close to this level of bandwidth, maybe good enough for certain applications. Some people are using interposers. Interposer is, I call it a two and a half D uh, design. It's not quite, 3D because you have two or more memories, but they're connected through a connection through another layer. So interposer of a two and a half D, it gives you better bandwidth, but in memory processing that I mentioned earlier, when the processor and memory are close to each other, that gives you a lot of bandwidth. And that would be closer to the biological systems where you have the computation and memory close to each other. The problem with matrix computation is if you put the data away from the processor, then it will take many cycles to get it back. And that becomes an issue. And this is the work that Han did at, at, at Stanford with uh, Bill Daly. And you can see that for a 32-bit integer addition, if that's the energy cost, if you're trying to do the 32-bit SRAM access, you will get that many, uh, more energy, like an order of magnitude or more in terms of energy cost. And if it's from the DRAM, it's really gonna be a very uh, high energy comp computation. So as much as we like to improve the multiplication and addition, we have to worry about the, uh, the access time and the energy hog of the memory. So this becomes a problem, memory should be included. Among all the techniques that are used for improving performance, we have to resort to some of the already techniques that we have, not only the accelerators, but we have to use something like loop op optimization. Uh, we teach loop unrolling in our graduate classes where you have a loop and you can uh, see the loop goes from I equal uh, to zero to N, but you can open the loop and have two iterations of the loop. It gives you more parallelism. Loop tiling is another thing. Loop tiling, if you remember, I mentioned the word tiling at the Intel processor. It is potentially possible that they are using those tiles to do the loop tiling computation. And loop tiling is if you have a large matrix like this, you can take one tile from here, multiply by that tile, generate the output tile. That would be perfect for Intel uh, matrix uh, tiles if that's what they're trying to do with their computation. Okay? And then you can see how these tiles work. And this would be a code without the tiling and code with tiling. That means that the, the programmer has to invoke this function of that processor to be able to use it. A little bit of memory access, again, 
We have to do the MAC operations. This is again uh, presented at the Victoria says uh, tutorial. We need the weights, activation, and the partial sum. So you need to do three read memory reads for a MAC operation. This becomes the bottleneck. Where is the weight? Where is the FMAP activation? Where's the partial sum? You desire them to be in the register file because register file is very close to the processor. If it's in the slower memory, then we're in trouble. Again, notice the performance here. This is the RF or the register file. The energy cost is small. If the data is coming from another PE or another buffer or DRAM, the cost goes up. So it goes back to this. I want to do the matrix computation, but I want the data to be close by. Well, you one could say you can't have it both, but yeah, we have to move in that direction in order to be able to meet the power requirement, especially if this is a embedded system, a mobile system that is used for machine learning inference. So there are two things. You can keep the, uh, you can keep the filters in place. You can have the input feature map activation are used and then you can change the different combinations. So in this case, we have the three forms of data reuse, okay? In one method, we can have the feature map reuse. The feature map is here, we change the filters, okay? The other map is that the, the filter maps are used in multiple times and we keep the feature maps different. So you can see the combination of these will give you the performance that you need. And again, looking at this, Notice that we have the weight stationary in the processor and the activation, the partial sum comes in. In the other way, the weights come in and these partial sums are stationary. Whenever they're stationary, the performance is better. And then you can have one that is no local reuse. Everything comes from the global buffer. You can guess the bottom one has the worst uh, performance and the power consumption. So the question comes in, how many of these registers do we need? And how do we remap our algorithm to be able to do this. So let's look at an animation. Again, this is from Victoria says. Um, so we have the input map, we have the filters, and you can see the registers that are in the processor. This value is created the partial sum. And then the next partial sum is generated here. And then finally the results are generated. I'm going to say a few words about uh, what have they done to improve the, uh, the number of computations we have. This is uh, the work of uh, Han and others. Remember I talked about the, the weights. Why not use some of the known techniques, compress them? So in this case, this is the linear quantizer for the weights, but sometimes you may be able to use a log two quantizer to increase the number of uh, weight values in certain ranges. I remember uh, at Bell Labs, uh, the quantization steps for coding, uh, you can use it because we know the range of the human uh, hearing uh, bandwidth. And so we can change the quantization to match that. We don't have to have a linear quantization. In this case, we emphasize certain weights and de-emphasize some other weights. So this is called the log domain compensation. The other technique is quantization. So that was compression, quantization. Why not quantize the weights? Because remember the computation has to do with weights times the input. So in this case, the blue ones are put in one index. Look at the colors, it's all blue. So we're gonna give it the address of three and we're gonna name those, we're gonna re position the weights to 2.00. So we're actually quantizing them into that uh, value. The second category, think of it as a memory address, two for the purple ones, and that would be 1.5. And the, uh, the pink ones, they're going to have the 00, zero because they're closer to each other. So this way we can have a very efficient way of handling these uh, weights and sharing them together. Okay, and that would be the mapping to this. So we have a mapping for the position of that value. So we wanna get that value, we go over here and get the 2.0. So 
Now, they applied these techniques, and if you use the quantization, if you have a floating point 32, if this is the accuracy you get, with 16 bit, you get very similar to 8 bit. At 6 bit, you get not as much accurate results. We did our own computation with the approximate computing, and uh, we were able to see that with approximate computation, also we can get close to the accuracy of the floating point. So that's what people are trying to do. Why, we, why do we have the data type of the floating point when we can apply it to a smaller number of bits because the neural network will give you the accuracy that you want? Another amazing result that uh, the group uh, Bill Daly did at Stanford is that they started pruning pruning the, the connections between the nodes. Remember the deep learning uh, steps? We had the convolutional uh, computation and that there was a edge going from one layer to an, another layer. What they did is they started pruning these links. So if you have fewer connections, what happens to the computation? The matrix becomes more sparse in terms of computation. So you have fewer steps fewer computation steps. And you go into a notion of uh, sparse matrix computation and save power and computation. It's a very interesting result because they pruned it, then they retrained it. This was the original trained network, pruned it, they retrained it. Let's look at the results. If you look at the red one, They did iterative pruning and retraining. They were able to drop 90% of the weights and still have accuracy close to when it was not. That's pretty impressive with that technique. If you, if you start uh, going to this range, maybe between 95, 96, then the, the error actually creeps up on you and you can get down to a lower level. So, and there's an interesting parity that I found out in one article. Uh, a newborn has about 50 trillion synapses. A one-year-old has 1,000 trillion synapses. By adolescence, we have done some pruning to 500 trillion synapses. And the question is, the pruning that Han and uh, his co-authors found out, is it something that the biological systems do? And is it, is it something else that we can do to uh, perhaps make it more efficient? But uh, uh, so it's really uh, interesting results. It's been cited a lot. Uh, it has a very high citation index. Again, here you can see pruning and quantization 2% means that 98% reduction, you get pretty close to the accuracy that you had. The accuracy loss is very little in that respect. So uh, with, with all this uh, discussion that I've had, I would like to make some concluding uh, remarks and final uh, position, okay? So there are, New applications related to machine learning that are coming up. Although some people are talking about uh, limitations of machine learning, I mentioned that it cannot do math. We have the catastrophic forgetfulness because if you go from one particular domain of training to another, it will be difficult to uh, do the job as good as it did before. They have techniques to deal with that, but this one is here to stay. And uh, it's obvious because of the amount of uh, investment that companies are doing. Uh, startups are being uh, taken away by large corporations and so on. I mentioned here, Microsoft acquired uh, Nuance. It's a medical applications company for $20 billion. They're not making accelerators or so on, but it shows that the, uh, that the machine learning is, has a major impact in, even in the area of uh, applications and software in, in medical profession, not to mention using machine learning algorithms to help out uh, with some of the diagnosis 
Uh, the problem we have with using machine learning for biomedical applications or diagnosing X-ray or MRI images is the training set. If you have enough training, then you can do a good job. Still, there is a problem that some of the pioneer researchers in this area have identified, and that is if you train with one particular X-ray device, and then another facility uses a different X-ray device, you may not get as good a result because they're two separate uh, uh, X-ray machines. They have their own uh, characteristics, but the human being can still do a good job. So it's not resolved yet. There are many papers and documents and uh, results that show that the machine learning can do a really good job. But uh, for instance, I think it was mentioned that uh, the, the computation for uh, detecting uh, prostate cancer wasn't very good because there were not enough training sets for that particular example that they used. But maybe for brain tumors, they had a lot more training set and uh, it worked out fine. And we were doing some of the work ourselves for um, PET scans uh, in, one of, in one of my students is working on that. And if you don't have enough data set, Getting to that accuracy of 90% is really hard. And uh, so you're limited by that, but it's a very crowded field. Many players, startups, uh, major corporations, government agencies, academia, all across the globe. You cannot think of a major country that is not spending uh, billions of dollars in this area and uh, and I think the plans for the United States is to spend a lot more in this area. Finally, uh, just to di digress from machine learning, I think quantum computing is following ML, uh, but has far more challenges. And uh, it is uh, classically very different from classical computer systems because we're not dealing with the binary logic uh, as opposed to machine learning, which is really all, all I said was all the architectural aspects that we have studied for the past 30 years, array processing, uh, matrix vector computation, systolic arrays, that domain will be far more exotic and people are working on that. And uh, we see again, countries are spending a lot of money in that, but it's far behind, has not impacted as much as machine learning, but uh, we should not be surprised if, uh, the current innovations and the future ones planned will make that a major player uh, in different types of applications perhaps that machine learning cannot handle. Okay, with that, I will stop Alan and uh, see if there are any Q and A's. Great, thank you, Professor Bagrazadeh. That was a fascinating discussion actually. Uh... It's also a great uh, uh, intro into some of the fundamental uh, neural net uh, processing. So that's cool. Uh, yeah, so for our first question though, right before we get into the domain Q&A, uh, we'd like to find out, um, uh, we'd like to find out from the folks that are on the call, uh, what professional organizations that you currently belong to. So there's a quick poll, uh, please go ahead and uh, provide uh, uh, your memberships, be awesome. All right, I think that should be enough time for people to remember their professional affiliations. <laughs> All right, uh, we do have a couple questions uh, before we uh, potentially segue off here into um, our, our more personal meeting format. Uh, Farhad uh, has a question for you, Professor. Uh, please discuss, uh, he's asking for you to discuss in, uh, quote unquote in-memory processing and right. maybe provide an example. Yeah. So as you can see, Alan, I'm going back. So I, the only picture I had is, is here. Can you see it? Yeah. It's yeah. On the screen. Uh, so the point is, what did I say? We need to have the data close to the processor. 
that's really critical. I mean, it's critical for many applications. That's why we have multiple level caches. That's why we have register files. We need the weights and those uh, activations and input F maps to be close to the processor. And so if you have in-memory processing, you provide that proximity. Proximity is very important. Processor and memory have to be close to each other. If the processor and memory are far apart, like in this case, then it has to chug along across the bus and it will take extra cycles. And so we will basically get to that terminology I said, starving the beast. If I have 60,000 processes, but I cannot feed them, they're as just good as just being a bunch of ALUs sitting on an array processor. So in-memory processing provides us with that uh, capability. The question comes in, how do you get the data to those local memory? That becomes another problem, right? So this is part of the planning and uh, basically moving the data before it's needed. It's all, all techniques that we have known before. That's why the machine learning is uh, resurrecting some of these old techniques. The systolic array was shocking. When I saw that, I said, wow, we're back to systolic arrays after 20 years of uh, hiatus. Okay, Farhad, I have a question. Celso, is that, did I pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, Celso, thanks for asking questions. Celso, yes, yeah, good anyone, question. Yeah, do you see that? Is anyone looking at a statistical approach yeah. to speed up um, CNNs? Yeah, no, I, I, well, I shouldn't say no because there are thousands of people working on this, but using branch prediction for this, I'm not so sure because it, uh, two, there are two issues here, right? I explained that the convolution is vector matrix vector computation. That was straight up out of the page, right? So how am I going to use branch prediction for that? All I want to do is multiply and add, right? So it will not apply to the matrix vector computation, which was the core of the computation, right? Does it apply to some other parts of it? Maybe, but the the ninety percent was the convolution, so. So it may not uh, apply to that uh, directly. And I don't know anybody has used statistical methods, but it could, it could be possible for improving the computation because the way we use the, the way Dehan and others discussed the uh, compression and quantization, it could be statistical. You saw the, how the compression worked with the statistical uh, quantization, looking at that, uh, not having a uniform quantization. So it may be applied there, but branch prediction for convolutional, uh, I'm not sure. It would be interesting. If you find the paper, please send it my way. Um, thank you. Yeah. Windsor, uh, thank you for your question. He says, have you heard of any work related to pre-processing uh, pruning based on causal analysis or post-processing of ML results using causal analysis as validation? Uh, the question partially comes from, we, we actually had a recent speaker uh, talk to us about causal analysis. Uh, not, so so I'm, I'm not very familiar with causal analysis, but I'm assuming that is something that happened in the past. You're trying to use that to learn from that, right? Is that is that what it is? If that's what you're saying, Windsor, uh, sure. Uh, Han showed that the pruning helps. So if you want to have a guided pruning based on causal analysis, I would think you get better results because it's guided, it's not just based on randomly or, uh, or based on some other algorithm. So I would think that might be useful. Yep. And Windsor, you could follow up on that with uh, uh, Professor Bragazade on the, on the Zoom meeting later. Um, Farouk has a question for you. He says, thank you for an outstanding review of the ML architectures. Has there been any work on multi-level logic implementation rather than the classic two-level logic? So, Again, uh, yes, I, I would not say no, because uh, uh, multi-level logic has been used uh, in the past. Remember, I mentioned about our approximate computing method using uh, Mitchell's algorithm. I didn't mention Mitchell's algorithm, but Mitchell takes, it goes back to 1960s, takes the computation, you go to log domain and you add instead of multiplying. So can you use multiple logic? Sure, if, if, it, if it helps you implement the, matrix vector computation more efficiently, why, I, I don't see why you couldn't do that. It goes back to what we have to do, right? So if your architecture lends itself to multi-level architecture, I, I would think that would be possible. Now, something comes to mind, which is kind of strange. If you can have multi-level logic with uh, a three-dimensional architecture of a memory, then that would be really good. Thank you. 
Now, Nima, uh, thank you, Nima, for your question. So, uh, asks since the architecture of processors is changing, like uh, one uh, like uh, one route Apple is following, uh, would that mean AI and machine learning algorithms should adjust to new architecture? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, Nima. Let's let's see what in, Intel has said. I mean, that that's a very good one. <laughs> Let me go back. If you recall, Nima, I had. Uh, I had some slides here. Guess what? They have plugins for different accelerators. <laughs> so they foresaw this, right? But what is it that is stationary is those register files. They want to have that data. Remember, to goes back to the data being close to the process, but they allow a different accelerator that is not doing matrix vector computation, maybe some other accelerator. So they're leaving the door open. It's not quite defined yet. So it is possible that you could plug in your favorite accelerator if it works with this tile-based architecture, okay? Uh, this, is the, this is the massive state of the processor and the accelerator will use it. How the two accelerators will share this, God knows, I don't know. <laughs> we were not been told yet. Uh, Vivian Chan asks, uh, which industry uh, do you think will get heavily influenced by machine learning next? Oh, that must be a fun one to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we ask which, which industry will not be impacted right. by machine learning? I think that would be a negation is better. Uh, I, I can't think agriculture, weather forecasting, uh, I mean, detecting bugs in chips and boards. Autonomous vehicles I mentioned, I saw an article, I was gonna put a picture from that, is that uh, uh, Boston, uh, what is that company in Boston that makes robots? Uh, Boston Scientific, no, not Boston Scientific. Uh, it's the one you've seen the videos of, of, a, of a guard uh, robot moving around. So IBM is teaming up with them. Uh, that's right, Boston Dynamics, thank you. Boston mm -hmm. Dynamics is working with IBM to use machine learning algorithms and their data centers to help with the, with, the, with the platforms they have. That's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, would the machine learning be used to replace me? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> It'll be a while. <laughs> Well, I, you know, it, I think it's interesting also how uh, machine learning is starting to get used to help train, right? So you don't have to do the 50,000 crashes into trees. And That's right. That's right. No, I, 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 Alan, that's a good point. The Spectrum article said, uh, a robotic expert at Google in London said, we can simulate that training, right? We can simulate that training. That's what the article said. I read it last week. But it's not good enough because when you put that system in place, it will have some issues that the simulator did not notice. Isn't that interesting? He said the simulated training is not good enough. It may be starting point. Right, right. So uh, I know you mentioned you're not super familiar with causal analysis. This might be actually better for our follow-on, but uh, Windsor has a follow-on and, and asks, has some of your grad students looked into the Tetrod tool to explore causal analysis? So I don't know if you have an answer. No, I, we haven't looked at uh, most of my students use uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch. That's what we, that's oh, what we yeah. use. Uh, we're not yeah. into that uh, causal analysis, but if it's good, could you send me an email with the, uh, well, I can Google it myself uh, uh, and I will uh, look into it. Thank you so much. That would and, be good uh, because we're trying to improve yeah. things, yeah. Yep. Uh, Bruce, thank you for your question. Uh, he asks, can we use fast convolution, uh, specifically things like FFT, multiply, inverse, you know, Fourier transform, that sort of thing? So I looked at uh, convolution the other day because it reminded me when I took the signal processing course, when you're convolving, convolving in time domain, you're multiplying frequency domain. That's what I remembered from the 70s when I took the course. So uh, if you can, basically convolution is similar to that. So you can actually apply that. And that's what vector processors do for doing FFT. And array processors have been doing FFT. And uh, so it would be interesting that we could do, but, but the FFT has an interesting butterfly structure, right? It has this butterfly structure, if you look at it. And uh, it has a very special uh, data movement that it may not be the same as a matrix vector competition, but it is possible to look into that for sure. Um, now, the last one I've got is a more of a comment, but I'm, I'm gonna read it, uh, uh, Professor Bagazadeh, because maybe uh, if you have any comments about this uh, observation, 
Ar Arthur is, sh is sharing with us, your presentation did a summary on neoclassical architectures. By contrast, neocortex architecture may be uh, possibly a, a more promising model. Uh, for example, C. Numenta and Jeff Hawkins and his introductory book, um, Thousand Brains. However, that lacks mechanisms analogous to back propagation and uses vastly more connectivity that present technology. So I don't know if that's something you might want to comment on. Uh, so when the connectivity comes to head, I have to put my VLSI hack on, right? Because if the connection is outside the chip, it's not good enough. It's gonna be very slow. Yeah. I forgot to mention the IBM uh, Telium processor. Some of you who might be familiar with VLSI, how many metal layers do you think that has? 17, it's off the scale. I had no idea that you could have a 17 metal layer design. So when it comes to connectivity, we have to worry about how the chip would scale properly or not, because as you saw, we're running into the Dennard's uh, limitations and so on. So we're not good at connectivity. As I mentioned before, we cannot repeat what the synapses are doing. There are trillions of connections. So any way we can do to improve that, it would get us closer, but we're not there yet at all. It's very far away. Mm -hmm. um, Nima has an interesting uh, kind of extrapolation question, I think. Um, you know, you talked about processor architecture based on the kind of math that's being used. So he asked, do you believe in future, do you believe in, in the future there might be a need for a processor that would take care of blockchain transactions or calculations? So Nima, I watched a video for blockchain many months ago, years ago, and uh, I'm not very familiar with it. I'm not into uh, that business, but if there's, there's money to be made, I assure you <laughs> there would be an architecture to optimize that. I can assure you that. And uh, so that people use the GPUs to do the computation. And so, uh, yes, there could be optimizations for that. What it takes is to look at the algorithms, break it up, apply what we know, and it will work out itself. Great. Uh, oh, there's uh, one more question that just came in um, by uh, uh, Mr. Anonymous. Uh, what do yeah. you foresee as early uses for quantum computing that machine, lear uh, machine learning will not be able to compete in? Yes, there are certain applications that certain organizations have been looking at for decades. And they're very good at that. And, uh, and uh, machine learning not, is not even close to that. Uh, remember what I said, machine learning is not good for math and uh, not good for intuition, cannot translate. And so uh, quantum computing can break uh, codes. They can do a lot of different techniques. And uh, you know, uh, so there would, it would be interesting. It would be very interesting that uh, the computing platform will have a quantum computing uh, accelerator and they will have a machine learning uh, accelerators to be able to handle a, a bunch of different applications. That's what the future would be. And I make another prediction that everything we see here will be integrated into, the, into one, one, uh, one processor, but most likely not a 2D, but it will be a 3D processor, which will include all the accelerators and layers, but that would be a few years uh, that will be achieved. So yes, that, that should be something like that. And thanks everyone for joining the webinar tonight. I think we had a great uh, uh, presentation by Professor Nader Bagherzadeh. Thank you again, uh, Professor. And